If we want to go to heaven, we need a total transformation. We need it as individuals, and we need it as a church. And the time has come to speak about these things, because we are told that the straight testimony will cause the shaking. to have a total transformation. Today we're going to look at some more typology. You know, prophecy is a marvelous tool. Prophecy can tell us where we are in the stream of time. And if we can superimpose typology on top of that, we get a better picture. It's like, like a coloring in book, isn't it? You color in the picture. And we looked at 1844, and we looked at the experience of 1844, when God started the gathering and the call out of the nations and into the wilderness experience. And then we looked at 1888, when they could have entered, but because of unbelief were turned back. And we looked at the typology of Caleb and uh, all of those things that happened there. And we looked at the anti-type with Jones and Wagner at the end. And then there was a second opportunity after the wilderness experience to go into Canaan. And they returned to Kadesh Barnea, but they failed again. <laughs> They failed again, but this time they didn't have to go back for 40 years, but they had to take a detour. And uh, we're going to look at that typology. And the story gets very interesting, because as we see all of these typologies fulfilled in the antitype, we get a picture as to where we are on our journey. Doesn't that make sense? If we fulfilled 1844 already the first entrance, and uh, we've had the wilderness experience with everything that goes along with that. If we could have also completed the second attempt, and maybe even completed the detour, and maybe even completed what comes thereafter, then we must be on the very threshold of entering into Canaan. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue with this uh, story. And remember that the theme is total transformation. What is God trying to teach us? He's trying to teach us to come into conformity with His will and to understand the plan of salvation, not from our human perspective, but from His divine perspective. Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea as the Lord spake unto me and we compassed Mount Seir many days. Yes, and we looked at that and how many years it was and all of that. And when that was finished and the Lord spoke unto me and said, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn ye northward. Go north! So they had the command to go north. And the Lord tested the children of Israel on this return to Kadesh, where they had failed before. 
And he let the waters dry up to prove their faith. Now this is fascinating. They have the command, go north. The water dries up. Logical thing, if you have faith, is to say, wow, we don't need this water anymore because we're on the move. <laughs> Not the children of Israel. After the command was, go north, there was pandemonium. Now, in 1920, the same message as preached in Minneapolis was repeated, and again, the Advent movement failed. And this is, you can find this in Tyler Bunch, the Exodus in type and anti-type, and even parts of this was taken up in uh, uh, the Spirit of Prophecy documents and things like that. So this is an interesting Interesting analogy. So there was a second opportunity to have entered. When the Hebrews were thirsty and could find no water, they became impatient. And did not remember the power of God, which had nearly 40 years before brought them water out of the rock. Instead of trusting in God, they complained of Moses and Aaron and said to them, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord would have been better to die in Korah's rebellion <laughs> than to go in the second time. Boy, we are a stubborn people. That is, they wished that they had been of that number who had been destroyed by the plague in the rebellion of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. We're an incredible people. So the second failure at Kadesh and the backward retreat from Canaan produced spiritual depression. Even Moses was depressed, and he became impatient. And his impatience cost him the privilege of going into Canaan with the people. Moses sins against God by ascribing the power to bring water out of the rock to himself, and he was not permitted to lead the people into the promised land. They had to wait. Aaron died was buried on Mount Hor, Moses on Mount Nebo eventually, although he did take them further from there. Whilst marching north from Mount Hor, the people passed through the wilderness of sin around Edom. And uh, here we are in Jordania. And according to tradition, this mountain over there, this white peak over there, is where Aaron supposedly was buried. And uh, Petra, the Edomite city, is in that area. And it, it's interesting that they even had the lion with the eagle's wings showing that it was a symbol of Babylon uh, in that time period. And then on this mountain, tradition has it that Miriam was buried round about here on top of this hill. So this is the sort of area that we're talking about. And this is the ancient city of Petra. Had the people, when brought into trial, trusted in God, the captain of the Lord's host would have led them through, through Edom. They would have taken the shortcut. Go north! But they grumbled. They could have taken the shortcut right through Edom. God would have you know, helped them. The fear of them would have rested upon the inhabitants of the land so that instead of manifesting hostility, they would have shown them favor. So now, what did the nations do? Showed them hostility. So now it was a tough journey. We don't have something like that, eh? The nations all love us all around, don't they? <laughs> eh? I mean, they just adore us. Oh boy, here come the Adventists! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the Israelites did not act promptly upon God's word. And while they were complaining and murmuring, the golden opportunity passed. And then when they were at last ready to present their request to the king, it was refused. So now we have to battle with hostility. Hostility of the nations, hostility of the churches, hostility of you know, all the giants around us, the evolutionists, the, all the isms, oh, they're all hostile. 
And we're still thinking we're the bee's knees and carrying on and everybody loves us, but deep down we know everybody hates us, right? It's just the way it is. And ever since they left Egypt, Satan had been steadily at work to throw hindrances and temptations in their way that they might not inherit Canaan. And by their own unbelief, they had repeatedly opened the door for him to resist the purpose of God. As we journey around Eden, a time of economic drought, financial uncertainty, we are also going to be depressed and murmur. But we should remember that Jesus was never depressed. He was never impatient because he knew no sin. These things come from a sinful nature. And if we want to have a total transformation then uh, we should try and get away from it. Discouragement also leads to criticism. So if we have a critical spirit, we must ask God to take it away. And they journeyed from Mount Hall by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. Now they had to go around it. They could have gone through it. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. That sounds like us. Heavy feet. Here we go. As they continued their journey towards the south, <laughs> where did they have to go? North! Here <laughs> yeah, they're going south. <laughs> their route lay through hot, sandy valley, destitute of shade or vegetation. The way seemed long and difficult, and they suffered from weariness and thirst. And again they failed to endure the test of their faith and patience. By continually dwelling on the dark side of their experiences, they separated themselves further and further from God. They lost sight of the fact that but for their murmuring when the water ceased at Kadesh, see, they were there the second time. They had to go back. They would have been spared the journey around Edom. God had purposed better things for them. Thus they cherished bitter thoughts concerning his dealings with them. Now it's fascinating that God said, leave the Edomites alone, leave uh, the Moabites alone. And he mentioned a couple of others. Uh, those were sort of sister churches. And so we have sister churches out there as well. And God is patient and is taking them, us around them. They're not very favorably inclined towards us. Egypt looked brighter and more desirable than liberty and the land to which God was leading them. So we read in Corinthians that it says, Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Neither murmur, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed by of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that think as he stands takes heed lest he fall. So there's a lesson there for us. And James talks about the grumbling. The tongue is a fire. Somebody said we must add a little fire extinguisher to the DVDs when they go out. So maybe I should take <laughs> heed of that as well. A world of iniquity, so is the tongue amongst our members, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, birds, serpents, we have all of these things. Things of the sea is tamed and has been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. These are strong words. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. I think that's why the Lord gave men wives, to constantly remind them to read that text. <laughs> well, this is the sort of area where Moses had struck the rock and struck it more than once, thus negating that Christ would be struck 
once. And he took the honor and the glory for himself. And they journeyed from Mount Hall, and it was a discouraging journey. And the people spoke against God and against Moses, wherefore have brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness. There's no bread, there's no water. What's drying up? Typologically speaking. The gospel is just dissipating. It's just getting watered down. It looks like the, the worms and the locusts <laughs> and the planter worms are having a feast. And our soul loathes this light bread, which stood for Christ. Christ. We want our own way. And so the Lord had to teach them a lesson. They didn't go in the first time because of neglecting his righteousness and neglecting his promise. The Adventists didn't go in because they didn't want to ah, have that imputed and imparted righteousness. They wanted to go in on their own strength. The second time round, 1920s, we see there was another agitation and again we had the same arguments. <laughs> And uh, the Lord sent fiery serpents amongst the people and they bit the people and many of them died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people and the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. What's the message? Righteousness by faith. Same message. Second time. If we don't get it, we can't enter. Because no one was allowed to enter with his own robe. Isn't that right? You had to have the right robe. So if we don't learn this lesson, that we're not saved by our bee's knees and by our knowledge and by everything we do, that's it. Brass is a combination of copper and zinc symbolizing the divine and human nature of Christ. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death, and he be put to death, says Deuteronomy, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Isn't that quite a type? Isn't that exactly what happened to Jesus? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, says Galatians, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So here we have the typology. And this is what the children of Israel had to learn, and this is what we have to learn on the journey around Edom, through all these sister churches, negotiating our way. Some of us thinking, well, ecumenism might help the problem or this or that. No, no, no. They might leave you alone because God has got his hand over you, but that knife is in the hand. Man, if they can only get hold of the back. <laughs> and what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. There's a solution. That's what we have to learn. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for has made him to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The most important lesson that we have to learn. Hebrews, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil. So the symbol of the serpent, that he became sin for us, is very appropriate. People always ask me, why would he, why would he you know, make a symbol of a serpent for Christ? It's the symbol of Christ being sin for us. And deliver them through fear of death where all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He became a human being. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to make him like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So, there was no poison in the serpent of brass. It was brass. And so there was no sin in Christ. But he became sin for us. So he took the symbol of the serpent. Yet Jesus is the anti-venom which saves us from death. Anti-venom is in the likeness of venom but is dead as Christ was dead to sin. Does that make sense? I know, I'm thinking here like a scientist. I'm trying to figure out what is the symbolism in this. And uh, I thought about anti-venom and, you know, how you make it. It's actually, you know, not alive or anything like that. And, well, I think that fits. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Or 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. There's nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. All I can do is say, yes, I want it. In fact, I must say, I hunger and thirst for it. So, it takes faith to apply the remedy. And faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As the people journeyed from Hall by way of the Red Sea to compass the land, they were much discouraged and complained of the hardship. And the people spoke against Moses and they muttered about the bread and then the fiery serpents came. And then they said, we have sinned. Isn't that interesting? We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone that is bitten and looks at it will be healed. So it's a look of faith. There's nothing you can do if you were bitten. In thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. See, it's always self-rising, like a mushroom. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water, who brought thee forth water out of the rock, of flint. So Christ will give you the living water out of the rock that is he. Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, the internalizing of his righteousness, imparted righteousness to prove thee to do thee good at the latter end. This is the lesson God's people had to learn. This is Mount Nebo where Moses eventually died. Now there's a Franciscan monastery over there. And we see that the dear St. Francis has got the marks in his hands 
And we've kicked Jesus out of the scene on top of this mount and uh, have put a mere human in his place. Isn't that rather sad? Rather sad, nevertheless, it tells you where everything is, the directions. If you look down over here, Nabulus and Bethlehem and uh, Hebron and Jericho, that's where they were going, sort of in that direction where they went afterwards. And as Moses lifted up the serpent, and here at this place they made a a sort of a model of it. I don't know whether it looked like that. But there it is. Even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3.14 That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. My, one of my favorite words in the Bible Whosoever. I love that word. It just cuts across all of this self-exaltation of many, many groups on our planet. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the lesson they had to learn. Make the serpent, said God to Moses resembling the living ones and to elevate it amongst the people. And everyone who was to look would find relief. Many had already died. Merely gazing upon the metallic in image would heal them. Fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters anxiously engaged in helping their suffering, dying friends to fix their languid eyes upon the serpents. If these faint and dying could only once look, they were perfectly restored. That's the solution to our problem. So here they learnt this lesson in the wilderness around Edom, going round all the sister churches, if we could say so, trying to understand the message of righteousness as opposed to self-obedience. They could not save themselves from the fatal effect of the poison. God alone was able to heal them. Yet they were required to show their faith in the provision which he had made. Look. Look at the great sin offering. They were compelled to look at the brazen serpent or die from the sting. We are compelled to look at Christ, our righteousness. So here comes the second lesson the same lesson, why is it so hard for a human being to learn that lesson? Because the flesh wars against it. All the religions of the world are salvation by works, aren't they? It's human nature. And it doesn't matter what we dish up, whether we give them a million gods or whether we give them one, as long as it's righteousness by works, whoever's in that religion is blindly happy. Isn't that so? And as long as I can also sell a religion which believes in uh, righteousness in sin, not giving up the flesh, then they're also happy. So we've covered all the religions of the world, including Christianity, and God is leading a people through in this entire maze and this mess to try and teach them that sin is exceedingly sinful and causes death. Obedience is absolutely essential to regain paradise lost. But the solution is not in self but outside of self. It's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson. And that's why this little group is despised no matter where it goes. The people well knew there was no power in the serpent of brass to cause such a change in those who looked upon it. The healing virtue was from God alone. That's the only thing that can save us. 
The lifting up of the brazen serpent was to teach Israel an important lesson. They could not save themselves from the fatal effect of the poison in their wounds. Only God can do it. And we have to learn this lesson again and again and again. And although this happened now typologically to the whole nation, it happens to each one of us individually because every single one of us will be brought round and round and round Edom until we finally get it. Or else we die from the serpent's sting. It's our choice. You must look in order to live. You must believe in the atonement. The poisonous serpents that infested the wilderness were called fiery serpents on account of the terrible effects produced by their sting, it causing violent inflammation and speedy death. Sin is exceedingly sinful. As the protecting hand of God was removed from Israel, great numbers of the people were attacked. So the serpents were symbolic of Satan, whose sting and venom is sin. And that's why you have these two opposing powers. You have the man of sin, who gathers everyone under his wing like a mother hen her chicks. And then you have this one group who says, no. Keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. The enemy is buying souls today very cheap. We have sold ourselves for naught, is the language of Scripture. One is selling his soul for the world's applause, another for money. One to gratify base passions, another for worldly amusements. Such bargains are made daily. Satan is bitten bidding for the purchase of Christ's blood and buying them cheap, notwithstanding the infinite price which has been paid for the ransom. <laughs> Let ministers and people remember that gospel truth ruins if it does not save. If you don't accept it, you're lost, you die. Many are unwilling to accept of Christ until the whole mystery of the plan of salvation shall be made plain to them. They refuse to look the look of faith, although they see that thousands have looked and have felt the efficacy of looking to the cross of Christ. And we have them in our ranks, brothers and sisters. People that must understand every single detail of some theology before you can be saved, and then try and impose this on everyone else so that everyone must see it in exactly the same light as they do. Don't we have it in our church as well? We must get away from that. We don't need that kind of stuff. Will we ever fully comprehend the intricacies of the incarnation? How can a finite mind understand that? Will we ever fully understand the nature of the God-man? Do you think so? Will we ever fully comprehend the nature of the Godhood? I don't think so. So let's not make things which go beyond what is written a test of belonging to God. And everybody must come exactly to this understanding or else they are lost. Look and live. There are too many, I believe, who make these points so prominent that they shut doors for themselves and for others. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Paul also says we look through the glass, what? Darkly. We, we can't understand everything. It'll take an eternity. And then we still won't comprehend. So fortunately, alternate, uh, eternity has no end. 
But we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. New King James. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord. Ooh, 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 ooh. Do you notice a problem? I said I'm naughty. I put it into every lecture now. Just drop a slide <laughs> and make people think. Scribes, if you look at this, we're all perfect. No, no, no. No, all I can do is become changed. Behold, is as in a glass, the glory of the Lord. And we are changed into His image. Sanctification is part of the process. Here, justification is enough. Does this make sense? Here the atonement stops at the cross. Here we have a sanctuary message. This is Adventism. And this is the will of Him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The typology is beautiful. We don't need to add anything. Paul always endeavored to direct the minds of his hearers to one great sacrifice to sin. And he talked about all the types and shadows and said, look and live. Look and live. The work of redemption involves consequences of which it is difficult for man to have any conception. So let's not pretend that we know everything. I has not seen nor ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the thing which God has prepared for them that love him. Hmm. <laughs> As great as our degradation is through sin, even greater will be the honor and exaltation through redeeming love. Let's look at that and make that sufficient. And let those who are all hooked up with special theologies say, Lord, I want to look, I want to live, I want to walk by your grace. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of, holy, of Israel and His Holy One, to Him whom man despises and to whom the nation abhorreth. Kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship because of the Lord that is faithful and the Holy One of Israel, and He shall choose thee. Everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Bottom line, it's not difficult to understand. It's just difficult for human nature to accept. When men and women can more fully comprehend the magnitude of the great sacrifice which was made by the majesty of heaven in dying in man's stead, then will the plan of salvation be magnified and reflections of Calvary will awaken tender, sacred, lively emotions in the Christian heart. And then you can praise God like you should. If those today who are teaching the Word of God would uplift the cross of Christ higher and still higher, their ministry would be far more successful. So this is the essence. This is the journey. This is what we have to learn. And uh, I think God in His providence places all these other religious systems around us so that we can clearly see the difference between truth and error. The danger is always that we will want to show that we have a better knowledge, a perfectionist knowledge, or a special knowledge, or whatever. The bottom line will always still remain, look and live. Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I 
Christ liveth in me. Help me now. Is that sanctification or justification? Sanctification. Sanctification. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. So the spiritual barrenness of the wilderness will drive us to Christ as our only hope as we march towards Zion. And when this message is comprehended, then will we be at the end of our journey. Those that looked away from the cross were bitten by serpents. Looking to live empowered them to march victoriously to Canaan. Here we go. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world. Not our works, but our faith. And he who that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that the Jesus is the Son of God. So when we go back to this message of justification by faith, we are referred to by the testimonies back to Wagner and Jones. Didn't learn it the first time, and didn't learn it the second time, had to encompass Edom. The uplifted Savior is to appear in his efficacious work as the lamb slain sitting upon the throne. We have to learn this law all over again. Seek with lowliness and meekness to understand the plan of salvation in Jesus. We are in the greatest peril when we receive praise of one another. That's another dangerous thing. We like to do that too when we enter into confederacy to exalt one another. The great burden of the Pharisees was to secure the praise of men. And Christ told them that that was all the reward they would ever receive. Wow. So, if we think we're doing a great job for God, hmm, careful. If we think we're evangelizing and doing a great job, careful. If we praise each other, careful. Who should we praise? Praise God. That counts for me. Counts for you. That counts for amazing discoveries. Twice the Exodus movement could not enter because of unbelief. The bite of the serpent can only be conquered if we look outside ourselves for the remedy. So let's walk circumspectly, humbly, carefully. If somebody preaches a message you like and it reaches the heart, say thank you to God. We need to turn our spiritual backs towards Egypt and our faces towards Canaan. This joyful journey is described in the following words. Moses made a serpent of brass and he put it on a pole and everyone who looked was saved. That's it. It's not that difficult. And the children of Israel set forward and pitched in Abot and they journeyed from Abot and pitched at whatever in the wilderness which is before Moab, towards the sun rising, and from thence they removed and pitched in the valley of Sarath. And now they're on the move, they've learned a lesson, and now the giants are going to come. And they're going to hammer this church. <laughs> and they're going to say, you morons, how can you preach six days? And how dare you say that uh, you are also obedient to the law. The law is gone. It's been taken away with. And we have all these isms to contend with. If we have a look of faith, how do we conquer the isms? Poof! Gone. If we lose the look of faith, the isms will swallow us. Now, I'm not going to read all these texts. I'm just putting them here. It's in numbers. There they were. And there were the Amorites, and there were the Moabites, and all of these people. 
And uh, from there they went to Beer and gathered the people, and Israel sang this song, Spring up, O well, sing ye unto it. They were not worried about water anymore. They were on their way. And the princes dug wells, and Israel sent messages unto Sion, king of the Amorites, let me pass through your land. You're a sister church of ours. <laughs> Come on, we're buddies, aren't we? Let me pass through. We will not turn into the fields or into the vineyards. We will not drink of the waters of the well. We will go along the king's highway until we pass your borders. But he would not let them through. We think these people are our friends. Uh -uh. We think they're brethren, fellow Protestants, fellow this. I'm abbreviating a little bit for the sake of the typology. Uh -uh. Israel smote him with the edge of the sword. This is a war. Israel took all the cities. They just took it away. Wow. And so Israel dwelt in the land of the Amorites. God dispossessed them. If you do not represent God, God takes away the candlestick and gives it to someone else. And then they went on their way to Bashan and there was Og. There was another giant. I wonder what he was. Was he spiritually, spiritualistically inclined? Did he perhaps teach that we are under grace and not under law? Or I don't know. One of them. You know, there are lots of them. And they smote him and his sons and all his people until there was none left him alive. They had learned a lesson. We can get rid of all these isms. And the Lord said, pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, and all the story. And he did to the children of Israel who were there, there when he destroyed the harems and all of these texts. We don't have to read them all. Let me pass through thy land. I will go along by the highway. I will neither turn to the right, left, or to the left. Uh, 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 uh. And thou shalt sell meat. And as the children of Esau, which dwell in Seir in the Moabites, which dwell in Ar did unto me until I shall pass over Jordan. But Sion, king of Heshbon, would not let them pass by. Do we have any friends out there who we consider family? I don't think so. We don't have any family. And we took all his cities at that time and utterly destroyed the men and the women. If we really have our faith in Jesus and we trust the Bible, we can take the word of God and say, look here. Your theology is not logical. Take that city. Your evolution theory is pathetic. It's an uncircumcised Philistine. Take the city. No problem. Then we turned and went up the way Bashan Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us. He and his people to battle. Oh, and he had great walls and gates and bars. These were giants. They are as nothing if we have faith. Cattle and all of these things. Deuteronomy, read it all there. And all these tribes and Gilead and Bashan and all of them. And they were all enemies. And when the message of Christ our hope is given, then our journey is almost over they returned from searching of the land 40 days. Remember the story? And in they went. But the men that went up with them said, We be not able to take this people. That's what the spies had said. And now here they were going through them. And they were knocking over these giants. One after the other. The ten spies had lost hope because of the giants of Anak. Was the father of the race called... Anakin, giants. Fear of the giants delayed the Israelites. Fear of the giants today is delaying us. The giants are the ideologies and powers of the day. Evolution, beast, false prophet, image of the beast. In 1888, these giants were small. Today they're massive. Look and live. They will be able to do nothing to you. 
Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I was there in my office. They had this long list of accusations against me. Long, long list. I was the head of the Department of Zoology. And the university had got a forum together to investigate the allegations. And my biggest opponent, a young man, had this list in his hand. And I wasn't allowed to see it. I didn't know how to defend myself. And of course, the issue was the giant. <laughs> evolution. How can you be a professor of zoology and not believe in evolution? And the students believed me rather than them. Oh, it was a war. It was a war. I went on my knees all alone in my office. And I said, Lord, it's not fair. I don't know what is on that list. I don't know what they're accusing me of. But this man is going to do it. But you can wipe out the giant if you want to. I can't do it. I can just look at the brazen serpent and say, can I live? And the man came out of his office. I've told this story before. And he walked and my secretary's office was right across me like that. And as he came across her doorway, he suddenly stood still. Young man in his mid-thirties. And he fell over like a tree that had been felled. <laughs> he missed the corner of a desk by so much. And there he lay, unconscious. Pandemonium called the medics. The medics came, they tried to stabilize him, put him on a stretcher, took him away. Only the list remained. <laughs> so they took the list into the uh, commission of inquiry. They didn't know what it was about. They had a list, they didn't have an accuser, he was gone. So they called me in, and they said, well, here are the points. And they started reading accusations against me. Now, he'd lined up all kinds of witnesses. But they didn't know who the witnesses were. <laughs> so they couldn't call his witnesses. And so I suggested to them, you know what? Why don't you call the whole class? I know where they are now. We have a timetable. We can have a look. They're now in, hmm, yes, most of them now will be in physiology or what it was. Let's call Professor so-and-so and ask whether, you know, those students could come over and testify as to what really happened. Because they were accusing me of indoctrinating the students against the evolution theory, against the giant dog. And uh, I'd never done it. Never done it. The students had always asked me, what do I believe? And I said, it's not part of the curriculum, and I'm not going to teach it in university time. Yes, but what do you believe? I said, it's got nothing to do with the curriculum, I'm not going to teach it. But if you want to know, arrange a lecture after hours, and I'll tell you what I believe. That's what I did. Is it illegal to tell someone after hours? No, I'm not taking university time, I'm not taking university money. And I'd always made sure that only the top evolutionists in the country would give the course in evolution. I would have them employed on research funds to come and give it. I'm not scared of the giant of Og, he can give his lecture, and then after hours I'll give mine. <laughs> Simple as that. Well, anyway, I was exonerated. There was another similar incident later on. By the way, this person, a very interesting story. He was very high. He had a very high position. And uh, he was even an advisor to the president in terms of biological matters. And then... He applied for promotion. He bypassed me, he sent it higher. 
But the high authority said, no, it must go through me, so they sent it back to me. And here it was on my desk. And I said again, Lord, what do I do? If I sign this, I make them even more powerful. If I don't sign it, well, then I'm a coward. <laughs> what do I do? Do I recommend it? Don't I recommend it? And I thought about it and I said, okay, let me divorce my feelings. Let me put them aside. How do I feel about this issue? I said, good scientist, no doubt. Great research track record, no doubt. Excellent lecturer, no doubt. Take your feelings, put them aside. I recommend that this scientist be promoted. And he was. And then we went through a, a shake-up in the country. And uh, the old regime disappeared. New regime came. And they consolidated universities and they reduced staff. And the formula is, last in, first out. He'd just been promoted in, out. Isn't that fascinating? Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, we don't have to look at all these giants of Og. Og, the king of Basham, came out against us, he and his people, to battle at Edrai. Later on, they made an accusation and said, you cannot be a scientist and believe in God at the same time. That was powerful. And again, a commission of inquiry. Another one of these giants. And what happened then? They said, that's against the Constitution, which guarantees religious freedom. Would you, me, like to take the university to court? <laughs> so it was turned around. So I said, no. I'll do better than that. I'll resign. So that they can have peace. I handed in my resignation. And they refused to accept it. They made me professor of the medical field. Because <laughs> that was what my research was. So I had peace and quiet from the Edomites and the Moabites and all of these people all around me for a while. The Lord can do that for us. Did you know that? Our king of Bashan was a giant. His bed was 13 foot long and 6 foot wide. How big that guy was. The Lord would have defeated them 30 years, 8 years earlier had they trusted in him. We can capitulate to these giants. Or we can decide we're going to pass by them and we're not going to be worried about them. Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle, for I will give thee of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar unto the children of Lot. So God recognizes that uh, these reformed giants around us were descendants, and he, has, he is so compassionate. And that's why I like st stories like the story of Ruth, which says, Ruth, a Moabites, said, Where you go, I will go, and your God shall be my God. God has his people in these churches. I'm not knocking them, but their theology is not right. They might be descendants of Abraham, but their theology is not right. And if we look unto Christ, the Amorites will be destroyed. Og will be destroyed. We don't have to worry about all of this. We don't have to go into an ecumenical relationship with this. We don't have any need such as this. This formidable army struck terror to the Israelites who were poorly prepared for an encounter with well-armed and well-disciplined forces. It doesn't matter who they were. You can read all about the Amorites, the kings, and all of these things. God wipes them out before you. In the fourth generation shall they come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God has compassion on all these people. So the journey around Edom had cost many their confidence. They focused on 
the brazen serpent, distrust of self, they learned that. And we are unprepared until we humble ourselves and exalt his glory. But we must believe and we must realize that the strength is not in us. I could have gone to that commission and said, I have all the arguments. I'll give them a lecture on evolution, <laughs> creation, and I'll blow them out of the water. Do you think I would have been successful? I don't think so. I don't think so. If we would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. That's it. The psalmist declares, The entrance of thy word giveth light, it gives understanding unto the simple. I know that I was exonerated, not because of my argument, because I gave none. Not because of any virtue in me, because they detested and despised me. <laughs> but because I went on my knees. That's the only reason. I said, I can't fight this, I can't win. Man is privileged to connect with Christ. And this, in this union is our only hope. Just how soon this refining process will begin, I cannot say. But it will be not long deferred. He whose fan is in the hand will cleanse his temple of its moral defilement. He will thoroughly purge his floor. We're going towards the end. The purging and cleansing will surely pass through every church in our land that has had great opportunities and privileges and has passed them by unheeded. More evidence is not what they want. Mm -mm. They need pure, sanctified hearts to gather up and retain all the light that God has given, and then they will walk in that light. We need not say the perils of the last days are soon to come upon us. They're already here. They're already here. Look and live. Repent. Be converted. Have your sins blotted out. And that's the solution to our problem. Notwithstanding the widespread disclension of faith and piety, they are true followers of Christ in these churches. In the Moabites. In the Edomites. We're not to go with them. We're going round them, and if they oppose, God will solve the problems. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelous for them. When the work is that of another spirit, under religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Yes. The only little bastion of light left is this little Advent movement marching towards Canaan. And God will call people into this light. When those who have reached the years of youth and manhood see no difference between our schools and the colleges of the world, I'd almost like to rephrase the spirit of prophecy. What if our schools become exactly like the world? And have no preference as to what they attend, though error is taught by priests at an example in the schools of the world, then there is need of closely examining the reason that lead to such a conclusion. I could show you statement after statement where she says of our own schools, if they become like that, don't send your children there. They're worse off there than in the world. Captivity will be turned. When the students are thus imbued, they will see that there is a great work to be done in the lines in which Christ worked. And the time they have given to amusements will be given up to doing earnest missionary work. Our captivity will let return. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. What are those garments? Christ's righteousness. O Jerusalem, the holy city, from henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck. O captive daughter of Zion. We have to learn this exclusivity. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore they shall know that in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. And then this beautiful verse in Isaiah. I want to do a whole sermon on feet 
Did I mention that to you? Here's one of the texts. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that says unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. This is the type of person God wants to bring forth from the situations we are in. According to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth, their ears shall be deaf, they shall lick the dust like a serpent, they shall move of their holes. Who is God like thee that pardoneth iniquity and passes transgression of the remnant of its heritage? They may mock God will take care of us. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace, we'll have to do in a time of great adversity. This is a battle and a march. The day is just before us. The members of the church will be individually tested and proved. Wow. We either learn it now, or we never learn it. When trees without fruit are cut down as cucumbers of the ground, when multitudes of false brethren are distinguished from the true, then the hidden ones will be revealed to view with hosannas. And she says, when the night is the darkest, the, sh the stars come out and they shine the brightest. The lessons of Christ in that wilderness on the second turn must be learnt as verily today as then. And now we're going to go one step closer. They come through this experience and they come to the very borders of Canaan. This terrible wilderness is behind them and then their greatest peril comes. That's in the next exciting episode. Amen. <laughs>